You good? Good. Okay. All right, so we'll call the meeting to order. It's 7.03. I'm joined by my colleagues, Mr. O'Leary, Mr. Studo, Mr. Walner, and Mrs. Gonzalez, and we'll start with a recitation of the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So we have a, a pretty light agenda, but a lot of attendees. So we'll, we'll let's begin, Mr. Gilberto, with the COVID-19 update. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Yes. So just by way of uh, a very brief update, as I think folks are aware, we uh, began running the second dose of the first responder clinics uh, for our um, first responders here in, um, in town. Um, that second dose administration began today. Uh, we, have re we have moved the clinic location over to the Hillview um, function facility and um, did that first round today. Um, we're also pleased to be able to offer the first phase two clinic for individuals age 75 and older. Uh, registration for that clinic opened at nine o'clock this morning. Uh, it did fill up quickly, um, full by about 9.30 or so for appointments scheduled on Wednesday. Um, I will note that we um, are receiving now 100 doses per week or expect to receive 100 doses per week from the State Department of Public Health. However, we opted to try to start this clinic a week earlier um, than it originally anticipated using some surplus that we had from our original disbursement associated with the first responders. So that limited the amount to about 70 doses for Wednesday's event. So it was a little bit smaller than we're expecting it to be on an ongoing basis moving forward. Um, there'll be information that'll be put out when registration for next week's clinic is scheduled to open, which right now we're planning for, fr for Monday, although it may be moved up until Friday. Um, regardless of what the timeline is, we will get it out um, through the media platforms, including the transcript. Um, and we do expect that that will be a 100 dose clinic. I'll also just add for um, everyone's edification that the uh, staff at the Senior Center has done a great job of fielding phone calls before there was a statewide phone number available. I'm trying to help people um, by phone to register for clinics, even if it was not the clinic here in North Reading. They're going to continue to be available for individuals who need help, although we encourage folks to reach out um, if they have a friend, neighbor, family member who they think might have a hard time registering online. Um, it is a fairly lengthy online process. Um, there are a lot of questions, but um, this is the, the model that's been set up by the state. And um, you know, even a, a fairly savvy internet user may have questions or concerns. So certainly we wanna offer assistance, but we ask folks in the community to do so as well. So um, that's sort of the quick update at this point that we have our regular uh, working COVID meeting tomorrow. And if there's any updates for the community, as a result of that, we'll probably publish them late tomorrow, or early Wednesday, and make sure they make the newspaper on Thursday. Michael, is this over 75 for this next round? I believe that it will be. If we are told that the state is moving to the next um, stage of phase two, then we will, um, uh, I think, adjust accordingly. Although I don't want to, um, buy, I don't want to be buying. Uh, I don't want to bind the uh, board of health with my comments there. But right now, it's the 75 and older population that we are uh, making the phase two vaccines available to. So I know you said <clears throat> the senior center is um, answering calls. What is the senior center set up to do by way of connecting with seniors or contacting seniors? And are, is the town planning any kind of a three one, you know, reverse nine one one outreach to seniors? What do we have for senior center doing that direct contact to get people assistance that they need? They're, they're getting quite a bit of phone of incoming phone traffic and have been responding to those phone calls. And in addition, on um, Thursday of last week, we were able to prepare a, ma a postcard mailing that went to I believe about two thousand senior citizens here in town, hitting their ma mailboxes on. Saturday, making them not only aware of the upcoming clinic, but the fact that we are looking to hold the clinics on a weekly basis. Um, there was some conversation about um, doing a targeted reverse 911 to the um, th that 2000 um, individual population that's out there, which uh, we may also do as we move into that second round. So we are trying to reach out um, in the avenues that we can, um, especially the, the medium that we know, the, or the media that we know will meet the most people. Um, and uh, we're going to continue to do that moving forward. Okay, thank you. All right, um, questions from, 
from Mr. Gilberto. Mr. O'Leary. Uh, just a comment. I mean, the Board of Health is meeting again Wednesday evening, you know, uh, regularly scheduled meeting. So if people want to tune in and get the most up-to-date information that'll be available, <clears throat> just go through the town's website and they can link into the Zoom meeting. But again, they've been working diligently along with the health department and the senior center. And, um, you know, I, I, get, I got a mailing um, because I'm over 65, uh, just, uh, you know, informing us as to, you know, it's for 75 now, but here's the link. And, uh, and then there's been some correspondence, uh, email correspondence back and forth from um, some um, members of our community who are trying to schedule, um, which was positive feedback, which is heartening uh, to see and hear that uh, they were able to easily um, access the website through our town website and uh, register their parents, uh, parent for, uh, for vaccination. So, so it seems to be working. Um, you know, the, the only tough part is that, you know, we're only having a hundred vaccines a week that are available to us. You know, I would hope and I would expect and anticipate that uh, that's going to increase as time goes on and as the resources become available. And um, I think the Board of Health and health agent uh, well positioned to uh, to help address the situation and get more people available in order to increase the number of vaccinations in our community. So, you know, we're attentive, uh, we're paying attention and uh, doing as best we can with the resources we've been given. Um, again, the, the uh, what's happened, you know, through the state, from the federal to the state, you know, has been uh, rocky at best. Uh, but I think uh, we're well positioned here in North Reading, and I think the, the health department, health agent, and the Board of Health have been uh, reacting appropriately and forecasting that we're going to be called upon to do more at a later date, and I hope we'll be able to rise to the challenge. So, but there'll be more to come. And again, people, those that are interested, tune into the Board of Health on Wednesday evening and um, keep uh, checking the webpage. And again, there have been mailings, and I, I would encourage the administration to continue the level of communication and increase it if possible, but they've been doing a good job. Thanks, Mr. O'Leary. Any other questions or comments <laughs> from my colleagues? All set. Okay, so let's move on to, I, by the way, for purposes of open meeting, Larry, I forgot to announce that this meeting is being recorded by NORCAM and it's also being recorded by our town administrator. Um, for the next order of business is a public comment. Is there anyone attending that would like to speak and provide public comment? If so, raise your hand. Let us know in the chat room. I see no, no, okay. I don't see any either. All right, so we can move on to our next order of business, which is to discuss the 104 Lowell Road variance application. Mr. Gilberto. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And uh, this item was put on there as a discussion item um, in regard to some um, comments that came up at the last meeting, as well as uh, I think some overall questions regarding the, the application given the town's role as the former, um, the former owner of the property and the RFP that we went through with it, the property as well. But um, I'll defer at the moment to Mr. Studo, who is the Planning Commission's liaison, and I know has been participating in the um, in their meetings with regard to this application, uh, as well you. as the Board of Appeals Thank liaison. You. Thank you, Mr. Gilberto. Uh, Mr. Studo. So uh, just an update. I know uh, we gave a, an update a couple of weeks ago on where Pulte was at, and I'll just briefly summarize that so I don't keep, you know, again, I don't want to be the reason this turns into a seven-hour meeting. Um, so... Pulte would like to add a story, which will equal about 52 units to two, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> to four of their buildings. And um, the question has become, you know, whether or not to allow it, they have to go in front of ZBA for a variance. Uh, and the reasoning behind it is that after doing more soil sample, just to spare everybody reading, you know, who, who, not on the board, the discussion, it's that they have discovered that after the fact, um, there were bigger problems with asbestos than the town and Pulte believed. Uh, so 
and what the state said back in 2007, I believe, from what I read. Um, so now comes the last meeting with the CPC. This is the update and this is the discussion just to kind of uh, for the board. So what Pulte has done to try to uh, make it a little bit more palatable is that some of the complaints were um, elevator on one of the buildings. So they are adding one of those. That's what came out of the discussion that's new that the board was not aware of unless you follow the CPC meeting. Uh, also, uh, the parking this time around will only be one to one where the first time around it was uh, two to one. So for every unit, there were two spots, which my understanding is when above and beyond what typically would be the, um, <clears throat> the requirement. Uh, and also, uh, I like to say that during the meeting, uh, Chair Pierce, Warren Pierce did agree that this, because of what happened the first time around, this time around going one to one with the parking was not a, you know, he didn't see an issue with uh, the two to one not being there again. Uh, so, so again, it's really that they're seeking a variance even though it's still going to be under 60 feet, they're seeking a variance to kind of make up, in their opinion, the shortfall that they're going to get because it's going to cost them between estimation eight to $12 million to clean up the asbestos that was just discovered. So that that's kind of the gist of it. And uh, my understanding here, so the purpose of this conversation is whether or not, because the board was the initial kind of you know, the select board was who cut the deal back in 2017, if it's appropriate for there to be just, you know, a general discussion amongst all the board members. I know Mr. Wallner has been in some of the meetings, but, you know, Chair Kate, you, Mr. O'Leary, and Mrs. Gonzalez have not uh, been uh, there. So it's kind of just getting your opinion and we can have a discussion. So you know, no one can ever say that we didn't at least talk about it or acknowledge it. And um, I, I'm going to reserve my opinion on it for now, but I just want to go back to the town administrator. Um, Mike, did I miss anything or can you add anything from the last CPC meeting that you were at as well? No, I, I think you kind of described the, uh, you know, the, the situation and what's pending before the planning commission um, and the, um, the board of appeals. Um, you know, this is um, a project where, you know, the application um, calls into consideration multiple boards, obviously not those, not just those that applied, but obviously um, the select board with regard to their role as the, the former owner. And, you know, we're, we're, you know, obviously expecting that everybody will be um, handling the application in accordance with whatever applicable bylaws or, uh, or state law um, is applied to it. Um, you know, the reality is that uh, Pulte is the, uh, the owner of the property and they are, um, they are not um, restricted from seeking what they are seeking here. Um, there was a request for proposals process that was followed pursuant to state law in conveying the property. And, um, you know, they've, um, they have, um, they performed under that transaction and in accordance with that transaction, but they are not bound um, after the fact um, from seeking the type of uh, relief that they are seeking here. And again, it would be a, a separate decision to be made by the regulatory boards as was indicated. And just to add to that, which was in the packet for my colleagues, um, this is a proposal for four of the buildings plan to be go from four story to five story. They don't exist yet, if I'm correct. The, this is, the request is to add obviously another story, which would be additional apartments. What's in the packet is a meeting for the zoning board, the board of appeals at, on the 11th at seven, it's a public hearing. So members of the public can provide comment. And I don't know when that, when is the CPC meeting on this? Do you know? The 11th. The, 11th. the same day? The Board of Appeals, I believe, is meeting this Thursday, February 11th, and I believe the next regular Planning Commission meeting is the following Tuesday, so that would be the 16th, if I have that correctly. I yeah. believe that's yep. when it's been yeah. continued to. Right. Okay. All right. Um, Chairman Nipelli, so can I any, just... Oh, Mr. Studo. Sorry, just for that comment. So the 
-hmm. one thing I did miss uh, to well not miss but didn't say so the CPC uh, reserve comment on it so it chose not to give um, an opinion ahead of the ZBA which I believe at first it seemed like from a meetings a couple of weeks ago that it was going to give one and then they just reserved a comment of not to give it. So at this point, um, you know, based on my understanding, depending on how it goes to the ZBA, I, I'm not exactly sure what the next step would be for CPC. So just, I just wanted to add that in. Mr. Studo, do you know how many additional units it looked like in the packet? It said on each floor, 13. I could have that wrong. 13 additional. Yeah, 52. 52 altogether for the four buildings. Okay. Do my colleagues have any questions or comments? Mr. O'Leary. Um, uh, first of all, this is a, a request that's being made so that it's, uh, it's not mandatory that the town take favorable action on it. And again, if uh, people recall, when this was a uh, request for proposal was put out and accepted, you know, I was in favor of including an affordable aspect, affordable housing aspect to this to this project. At the time, it was 450 units, and we were looking for 20, 25 percent to be affordable. But again, the, the dollar amount was a 30 million dollar uh, proposal for payment for the property if it was not affordable, and 18 million if it was affordable. Uh, at the time, you know, to me, this was found money, and we could uh, help address the affordable housing needs of an over 55 uh, with a minimal impact on school department, on the school department, if we went, went with it. But again, the, the, the powers that be at the time uh, determined that the $30 million proposal was um, most advantageous for the town. And, um, you know, we netted approximately $20 million, we meaning the town of North Reading out of the proposal as opposed to approximately $12 million. Um, I understand and, uh, and appreciate uh, the concerns and the uh, challenges that uh, Pulte is facing here. Um, but what they're requesting is for the town to assist them in making up for, um, to me, a lack of due diligence on their part in assessing what the, the property conditions were at the time. And, you know, with 52 units, um, if we put 52 units of market rate um, units on, on, on the books, that's another five more of affordable that we need to address going forward. Already when a determination was made that 450 units were gonna go in there, you know, we put ourselves behind the eight ball to the tune of four, 10 percent, um, 45 units of affordable housing that we have to make up somewhere else. And again, that was a conscious decision that was made and that's fine. But now we're looking to entertain a request by the developer um, for an additional 50 units, which means another five units that we have to do for affordable. And, and to me, if we're going to entertain it, they need to entertain assisting us in meeting our affordable housing needs. And again, in order to do that with an additional 50 units, uh, you know, I don't think it's unreasonable for us to request a 20% uh, participation rate in relation to affordable units of the additional four or five buildings that they're building here uh, to assist us in meeting our affordable housing needs. And it has a, a, a minimal impact on their, um, their bottom line. And so we can, it's a, it's a, it's a win-win. So to me, you know, if, um, and again, we don't have the, we meaning the board of the select board don't have a, a say in this, but the uh, Planning Commission and certainly the Board of Appeals do in their consideration. I think they should uh, request of the developer, uh, while it's not mandatory, not necessary, uh, at least a 20% affordable uh, housing aspect to it going forward of the 52 units that they're looking for. And then, um, you know, if they don't want to honor that request, we don't necessarily have to honor theirs either. And again, I recognize that if they put another 52 units on the on the tax rolls, you know, for an over 55 development, from a, a tax standpoint and a return on investment, it's a good deal for the town. But we still have a moral obligation to meet 
our, um, our obligations on the affordable housing of 10% and we're starting to fall behind again. So um, I think it needs to be balanced. And I think they're coming here looking for an accommodation and I think they need to help accommodate us in meeting our needs too. And I don't think it's unreasonable to uh, request a 20% or 10, 10 of those units to be affordable. And if the Board of Appeals could do that, I think it'd be wonderful. Thank you, Mr. O'Leary. Any other comments from my colleagues? Mr. Walner. So, um, you know, one of the concerns I had was just the height, adding on that extra height. So just as a reminder to people listening, if you look at Edgewood, it's a three floor, it's a three story building. The, the uh, Martin's Landing right now is four stories, but the good news is those four buildings are in the back. So actually that extra height doesn't really bother me as much. It's not really, in, it, it's not really interfering with anybody's sight line or, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't see it as that big of a deal after all. And it is set in the back. So that's kind of good news. Um, I am also was with the EDC. I think I was chair at the time we did uh, negotiate that RFP with Pulte and we had to decide between the 18 million and the 30 million affordable housing. And the thought was that we would take the 30 million and use that extra money to set up affordable housing elsewhere in town, which I think is still partially some of the intention. Um, because we knew we had a differential, but we needed affordable housing in other parts of the town, not necessarily outside there. So take the money now and go with it. But it is a big difference between 450, which is what we agreed to, 450 units, and now you know they're adding on another 52. So I'm, I'm in agreement with Steve O'Leary. I think we should just ask for one of the floors of the buildings make a 13 unit should be affordable housing. I think one of us should go down or as many people, I guess, as we can get down there on Thursday and make the request. We've looked at it legally, which Mike, Michael's already mentioned. We don't have any legal leverage to stop this. It is in their right to do this. It's also in our right to say, no, not our right, but ZBA's right to do it. But I do think we should be expressing our, our if we have consensus tonight um, that we're looking for and I'm saying 13 units, one of the floors should go for four units because it fits in the spirit of what we were talking about originally. And I think I think they would actually be compatible with that. That's my just belief. That's my biggest, those are my biggest thoughts about this. Thank you, Mr. Walner. Any other comments? Mr. Gonzalez? Um, I'm just, uh, you know, reading this and um, I read it earlier, I'm just going over it again, that they're, they're really not asking for more than what they actually are allowed. Um, they're allowed 60 feet, they're asking for 59.4. So they're within those limits that they're, that they have a right to do um, those five stories. Um, and considering I mean, I don't know. I mean, Mr. O'Leary, you said that they dropped the ball. Um, I guess they, they relied on, on tests that the town had already done at one point and assumed, I guess we shouldn't have ever assume, but assumed that those were legitimate tests. So, um, I mean, you can ask, you can, you, you can make a suggestion to them and, and if, and if they're okay with it, that's fine. But um, I, I mean, I just feel like this is kind of cut and dry. I think that they should be allowed to do that. With regard to that uh, reliance though, there was incorporated into the disposition agreement a, a fairly lengthy due diligence process built in for them. And to my recollection of that, contract, it was actually extended. And it, if I'm recalling it right, it was extended more than once, giving them additional time. And the due diligence obligation is a, was upon them. So I just want to clear that up that it doesn't matter whose test they relied upon, or if they're even asserting that as a basis to support the request, it seems not really a good support based on the, the agreement that was in place. When I, um, when I heard, just, to, just to, to your point, when I heard them describe this during the first round of the CPC meeting, they were saying, you know, the town did the due diligence, they did the due diligence. 
but you just don't know until you dig up the dirt what you're going to find. And they did find stuff that, you know, nobody anticipated. So they weren't saying, you know, we were negligent in any way. No, no, they weren't saying that. Yeah, they were just yeah. saying, you know, it's well, just they one can't of really, things. well, they can't really say that. So, yeah. but in any event, I just they wanted to, I just want to make sure that Mrs. Gonzalez, what, that you know that they did have a due diligence period. So I think what, when, you know, they certainly within their, within the zoning to expand it, um, but what was in the RFP and, and proved, and Mr. O'Leary is right, it was much more beneficial to the town, obviously, to get $10 million more. I think it might have even been $11 million more um, for this and, and then accepting the lower you know, amount. So it's clearly been extremely beneficial to the town for all these several years. And I believe that the select board voted unanimously to accept that. Um, that was the rec that was the one that was recommended by uh, the other boards that had reviewed this, and the select board unanimously um, voted on that one. So it's been been great for the town that that's come in. But setting that aside, I think is so. It's your position that we can ask. Um, well, it doesn't hurt to ask. Um, I just don't know what you know, that would, you know, by way of a, a letter to the board or is, is that what the, the consensus of the board is to send them a letter saying, I know Mr. Suda, <laughs> I need to give you a chance to, to talk about this as well. So go ahead, Mr. Studo. So um, I now have had uh, weeks to think about this. Um, you know, I had a gut feeling it was gonna end up here even though at first it seemed like it was a simple CPC ZBA. So here's a couple, here, here's how I'm looking at it. And I wasn't there for when this went down. So a couple things. Um, so from a purely business perspective, and I'll explain why I think this is important. We cut a deal. We got 30 million. Um, they met the parameters. They're asking for a little bit more. They were able to keep it under the 60 feet, which does help their argument. Um, they could have probably done a little bit more due diligence. Everyone can always do that, right? Uh, how, however, I don't think, you know, I, I mean, this could have been on us too. I mean, think about it. What if we were the ones that somehow were involved developing? I don't know if the town ever does that, but we would have eventually came to the same result they did when we started digging if we were actually doing it. Um, so maybe I'm not saying the state dropped the ball, but maybe there should have been a little bit more. So <clears throat> I say that because my fear is, and, and by the way, before I state this, my opinion is that this should be ZBA all the way. I think the board, each member is entitled to their opinion. They should give their opinion, but it should be ZBA that looks at it on the merits and they should be the ones like Mr. Walner said, if people go down there on Thursday and make, a request, but it should be the ZBA, the voting members of the ZBA who take the lead on this. And if they totally disagree with what we're saying, that's how it should be. Like if this is on their, in their court. My fear is that being in CPC, I've learned we need developers to do a lot in this town over the next decade. I don't want to give the message that what North Reading does is cuts a good deal and when you need something later, not that we're trying to help you, but we're going to try to get some more out of it. Because I can tell you, being on the CPC now, that we have a lot of we have we have a lot of projects we want to do. And if we don't if we don't have developers to come to the table, North Reading is going to look the same in ten years. It's not going to change. So that's my fear. Because if I was a business owner, again, I'm not saying that we recommend or even give an opinion to the ZBA that they should approve this request. I'm, I'm agnostic to it. I have no relationship with Pulte. I have none. However, I do fear that if this, if the, if we do, and I do believe in affordable housing, I mean, we're talking a lot about it, but if we even give the appearance that when a developer gives us tens of millions of dollars, and then they may want to do something later on that we we do the, aha, well, we couldn't get this Four years ago, we want it now. We give that appearance, no one's going to do business here. 
because I can tell you that the new generation of developers, they're, they're just, I, they're emboldened. There's so much business out there. They don't have to do business in North Reading. They don't care. I have a lot of clients that are big developers. I can tell you that like, they just, they can pick and choose right now, which towns they can work with. And like, that's my fear that, you know, there's a lot of great ideas that I've listened to from Rich, Mr. O'Leary, everybody here. And they, especially on the CPC. And I just don't inadvertently want to put any of those ideas in danger that the developer crowd knows that, well, if you deal with North Reading, you better get it right the first time. Because if you go back later, you might have a problem. So that's my opinion that I think it should be ZBA all the way. And then, you know, if, if they can find a way to give us a little bit better on the affordable, fine. But it should be, it should clearly be a request. That's, I think I think we're we're all in agreement, Mr. Sudo. Just just so we're you know, it was Pulte itself that submitted yeah. both proposals. <clears throat> Pulte submitted the affordable housing proposal for eighteen or nineteen million, and Pulte submitted the over fifty five you know market rate proposal. So it, it, this is the same developer. And I don't think we have a bad rapport whatsoever with Pulte. Oh, and I, I, I don't think we do, Chair yeah. Kate. I'm not saying yeah. that. I'm saying though that it, it's for, it's looking into the future and we're looking at some other projects where some developers have already commented on and they're not, it, 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 it just, to me, it like didn't, I mean, a lot has to do with like just the town. And I just, I just want to make sure that if we, do business that we can continue to do it. And I'm not even saying we're, we're doing anything wrong here. It's just that sometimes, you know, there's unintended consequences. That's what I'm saying. That's what I want to avoid. In well, my I think we, I think we have a consensus of the colleagues that at least want to, by way of a resolve our communication, reach out. The other thing we might be able to do, not that, you know, this, this is another consideration from my colleagues and not that we want to put more work upon the TA, but the TA could reach out. I don't think we have anyone here from Pulte this evening, but the TA could, we could also ask the TA to reach out to, you know, sort of put that notion in, in Pulte's. It, Mr. O'Leary raised it two weeks ago at our hearing. So it's not as though this is a, was, is going to come as a surprise. He raised it during our hearing that that was something that he wanted us to uh, Mr. Early, I see your hand up. Just give me one second. I think we could ask the TA to possibly reach out to the developer as well as they're preparing for this hearing to see whether or not that's something they might be able to consider. And I don't know if, if you already have done that, uh, Mr. Gilberto, but I think Mr. Gil Gilberto would be probably waiting for us and waiting for some direction from us to see if that's even a possibility. Um, but let me just go to let me just go to Mr. O'Leary and then to Mr. Gilberto. Mr. O'Leary's kind of a senior. Mr. O'Leary. Yeah, I, 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 we do not have a consensus here as far as I'm concerned. Um, to me, it, okay, let me step back here. They made a, we had a request for proposal and they put out two proposals here, $30 million, non-affordable, 18 million affordable, 460 units, they had the opportunity, several opportunities to do their due diligence and do whatever they needed to do in order to, um, this is before they put out their bid for, they put in their uh, proposal for $30 million to do the due diligence that needed to be done. And again, if I'm gonna invest $30 million, I'm gonna invest a significant amount of money in doing the due diligence necessary to probably assess the, uh, the property that I'm gonna build on. Um, Apparently they thought they did well enough. And again, they found something else. But again, that's not our fault or responsibility. We did ours, they did theirs. They had opportunities and requested uh, continuances in order to, to do more due diligence, which we graciously and willingly um, granted. Um, so, so this is on them, first and foremost. Uh, secondly, again, a conscious decision was made and the chair is absolutely right. It was a unanimous decision of the board of which I was a member at the time to move forward with the request for proposal for $30 million. But that was not without a significant amount of discussion in relation to you know, what were our opportunities. I advocated for the $18 million one, 
But I also wanted to present a united front to Mr. Studo's point that, you know, when a developer comes in and looking to develop in North Reading, that we present a united front in, in offering an opportunity to come in and buy the property and develop with which the majority of the board fell upon. So I did my bidding. I failed to convince a majority to go with the 18 million. And then I went with the majority in relation to going with the $30 million project in order to present a united front and a good image for the community going forward for future development. That being said, uh, I don't disagree that they don't care. Other developers coming in and looking at us don't care. All they're looking at is the bottom line because people like Pulte, and, and again, they're a very reputable organization, um, do a great job, but then they come and they go. I mean, this is a, a condo development where once they're sold out, we have no further relationship with Pulte development. You know, and those 502 or the 460 homeowners there and their association are the ones that we have to deal with moving forward. All they care about is their bottom line. They made a mistake and they're looking for us to assist them in covering the cost of their mistake by coming in and asking for relief under our zoning bylaws to cover their costs, additional costs. In return, they're offering nothing else to us other than another 52 units, which again, we have to provide police and fire protection and other public services um, for which their taxes are gonna pay for. However, we still have an obligation to meet our affordable housing needs, which is 10% under the, the state guidelines. So for every 10 units, we have to come up with another affordable unit. This is above and beyond. So we do have an opportunity here to talk with them. And again, I'm fine with requests, but I'm also drawing a line in the sand. This is to help them make up for lost rev anticipated revenues. Lost anticipated revenues because they goofed. They made a mistake. They didn't do the due diligence, uh, enough due diligence in order to forecast what, what's gonna be needed to, to clean up the site. There's nothing wrong with us to insist, and I'm not saying request, but to insist that for what they're looking for, grant and relief, assist us in meeting our affordable housing needs. There's nothing wrong with that. And it's not a hold up, it's not a stick up, and it's not a bad image for the community. We've given them 450 units of market rate units. They need to now make up for their mistake, for their oversight, their unforeseen expenses. They're asking the town to grant them 100% relief. All I'm saying is, I'm willing to give you a 75% relief or 80% relief. Give us 20% relief towards our affordable housing aspect of it. That's certainly, you know, they can, they have a business decision to make. We have a moral obligation to meet and an opportunity to have them assist us in meeting that. All right, we and, need to move, we do need oh, to move no. this. So, so, so we, to do, me, we do need to move this dialogue yeah, forward. You can move it along, uh, but the bottom line is we need to ask our Board of Appeals to assist us in meeting that moral obligation. So if we wanna do that, I think we need to take a strong position saying, you know, I, I have no problem saying we don't need 52 more units at that, at that site. And what they bought is what they got. And that's, that, that's fine. But if they're looking for more to help them cover their costs and move along, they need to help us move along, cover their costs and help us meet our affordable needs. It is not unreasonable. And I think we should be taking a strong position, not a request and saying, we don't have to grant this. There's no need for us to grant it. And if they want to, they were looking for assistance and covering their costs, they need to assist us covering our affordable housing needs. So that's my position. Right. I, and I, I think we, we understand, uh, I'm sure, I do want, think we understand your position. I think in the context of this, we as a board aren't the permit granting authority and we can't mandate the moral obligation to the I, I agree Board of Appeal. I'm not looking to mandate. But where That's I'm not. saying we have a consensus, Mr. O'Leary, is I believe all five of us want to get that communicate. We have talked about it now in two open meetings as a board. 
we're all on the same page with regard to communicating that. The, the Board of Appeals and has its own standard, legal standard by which it's gonna determine the application. So there has to be some, some steps taken if we communicate that to Pulte or to the board as, a, as our board, you know, that the desire that these, the, that a percentage of these units that they're proposing be, be uh, affordable, that's by way of communication. We can't insist upon it like you're suggesting. We can only make the recommendation or the suggestion or the request is what we're talking about this evening. But I heard from my colleagues, some of my colleagues here that, well, they're allowed it under the 60 foot height. They're allowed it, so maybe, so we should grant it. I'm not, no, we don't have to grant it. We shouldn't grant it. And we shouldn't even consider granting it unless and until they help us meet our affordable housing needs. That's my position. So there isn't a consensus. To me, I'm willing to, I'm willing to advise and, and ask the, the Board of Appeals to consider saying no, because they don't have to say yes, unless there's something in it for the town other than tax revenue from a unit and not meet our affordable housing needs. Okay, Mr. Gilberto, I know you had your hand up on, before we recognized Mr. O'Leary with regard to any communications with Pulte. Yes, Madam Chair, I, I believe that there have been um, some informal communications with uh, with Polte, and there have been a couple of discussions in um, in public meetings of the um, the Planning Commission. You know, with regard to a potential request or request for uh, consideration, um, my uh, to my discussions with Town Council regarding the process. Um, the recommendation would be that uh, feedback be provided in the form of request to the Board of Appeals for its consideration in the review, um, rather than going directly to uh, to Polte. So that would be my recommendation if we were going to provide, if the Board so chose to provide feedback. Okay, thank you, Mr. Gilberto. Mr. Walner. Just briefly, the um, during the original CPC meeting, I actually brought up about I was comparing the affordability versus not affordability. So they've heard this issue. They're aware of that this is a potential request that we're going to have because it was discussed right at the very beginning when they made their proposal. The second thing is, you know, I've explored this with Michael. All we can do is make a request. I mean, we, you know, there's no granting. There's no, you know, we have no authority other than just to make a request. And that's, you know, I, I, I'm not anti anybody. I just think it's like, we're just trying to be good neighbors and, I think we're making a request to uh, bring in some affordability uh, to the ZBA, and I think it should be delivered right to the ZBA because I think we're out of time to write a letter or anything else like that. And one of us goes down and just delivers the message, and I think that's the best we can do. And I don't see that as – I think it's a, it's a responsible position. I don't think it sets a bad precedent for anybody else who wants to do projects in our town. I'm very sensitive to the projects we want to do in town, and I think uh, – I don't see how one connects with the other. So I'm – I'd be very comfortable to make the request for somebody else who feels comfortable should be able to make the request, but I think, you know, we should just give our opinion. I do think we have a consensus that we think making a request for affordability as part of the agreement would be a good thing to have happen for the town and the ZBA should give it consideration. That's all we can do. And Mr. Walner, are you comfortable with making that request in the form that Mr. O'Leary says? It, it's, this, it does not, it requires permitting and it, it does not have to be permitted and should not be permitted unless there's an affordable housing proposal incorporated into the additional units. I, I wouldn't be that strong. I would just, all we can do is make a request. We can't, ZBA is in charge. We can't, CPC doesn't have, an, it's really just the ZBA who's going to decide. We can okay. just make a request. So I, I'm not quite sure what you're asking, but. Um, okay. Mrs. Gonzalez. Delivery is everything, I think. You know, you, you doesn't hurt to ask, but I don't think it should be demanded. Mr. Studo. So I think. Um, I would have found it hard to believe that, you know, where, when it comes, I mean, at, at the hearing, I do feel that, uh, 
after this meeting, there was going to be a discussion. I was going to be at the meeting as liaison. So, you know, I, if we can come up with a way, I mean, if request is something and, and I do feel that that's what Mr. O'Leary is saying. I mean, he, I mean, it, it's like, maybe said a little stronger, but I don't, I don't think he's trying to intend it to be anything where we're trying to force the issue. Um, but I, if there, if there's even something written, I can either, I can either wing it, like literally just say exactly what we talked about, where it's, you know, it would be the select board had a discussion and it would, you know, it would be nice if there was a way to incorporate affordable housing into this new plan for the next, for the 52 units. Um, you know, and I, 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 uh, from there, I mean, there's people that know more about me about uh, about the process about what the percentage should be, but yeah, I don't think it's, you know, and that's what I meant. I, I don't, I didn't mean to say that we shouldn't try to ask for something, but again, I, I agree with Mrs. Gonzalez. It's the delivery. Ask and request is very different than tell. I think that's. Well if we were to do this, I, I think as a board, we would move to um, prepare correspondence and that correspondence should should be sent to the Z, the Board of Appeal as well as the developer before the meeting. And of course you as the liaison, because you're going to the meeting can represent the board's position in public. All five of us could go if we wanted to, to attend that and represent, but you can, convey the board's position as the liaison, obviously at that meeting, if you were planning to attend it. I do feel that we, though the, the board has its own legal standard, speaking from the chair, I do feel that they know the number of units that are going there. They've already have a plan. It's one floor up, it's a specific number. And I do agree with Mr. O'Leary, now is the time for us to, you know, Try to try to ensure that they factor that in. Twenty percent, I think, is a good number, um, but you know, I think it should be a consideration. They know the number of units that they're proposing there, so that it it's, and they know that based on that number of units, they're going to recoup some of the lost revenues that they were projecting for themselves. So they've done these calculations. So they're still going to make the revenue with the, with that number of units, whether or not some are affordable or not. So, um, but I think it should be done in a written communication. And I think we do have to move along to other business. So we, we should try to put a motion together and put a, put a plan together for this and then move along. So we do have a lot of other business to get to. Mr. O'Leary. I don't see any significant benefit to the town by um, agreeing to their request for the variances here for the additional 52 units, even from an economic standpoint. We have done all of our forecasting and everything that uh, in relation to this project based upon uh, the request for proposals and what was accepted here. So this is like a, um, a windfall for for the town if they come up with another additional 50 units with some additional responsibilities to meet the uh, public safety and public health needs of, of those units. Uh, but it's nothing that we forecasted for, anticipated or, or need. Uh, on the other hand, they're looking for relief to meet their bottom line. So to me, it's not a request here. If you want us to consider this, you need to have an affordable housing aspect to it. Otherwise, it's not worth it to us. And that's the message we should send from the, this board to the developer for the Board of Appeals to consider. And again, the Board of, board of Appeals can make whatever decision they think is in, is in the best interest of everybody. And I'm not gonna second guess them. But I mean, it comes from us as to what we think is in the town's best interest. And to me, an additional 52 units with at least 10 of them being affordable is not an unreasonable request to assist the developer in recouping some of the losses because of their lack of due diligence. So to me, it's, it is all or nothing. Okay, you know, I, I know, Mr. O'Leary, you, you, you have made that point. 
you have made that point. It's just not a consensus of the board. The consensus that we are at though is a consensus or the, the entire board wants to send a communication with regard to that. The board does not want to send it in the way that you're asking. The majority of the board doesn't, at, at least at this point. I don't so, know. Yeah, I don't know that. I understand what you're saying. We all understand what you're saying. And I, I would agree, We're, this is the opportunity. They're, they've planned it out. They go on one floor up if they're approved. This is the opportunity to request that. So I just think the majority of the board doesn't want it to be in the form of insisting upon that. So we have to come up with another means of communicating what we feel as a select board is in the best interest of the town there. So we're in agreement there should be a letter sent. We're in agreement there should be a letter sent to the ZBA as well, to the BOA as well as to, the, uh, to Pulte Homes. Our feeling that at least a portion, a percentage of the proposed units should be affordable housing units. If the, if the request is granted, if the variance is granted, Okay, so we're in agreement at least to that point, right? Do I have the agreement of my colleagues at least as to that? Yep. Yes. Yes. And we're, we're in agreement that should be written to a written communication to the board as well as to the, um, you know, to the to the developer, right? We have the consensus with regard to that, and the consensus with regard to Mr. Studo representing the board's position to the developer at the public hearing as the liaison, right? And and that doesn't that doesn't pro prohibit anyone else from attending and speaking as a citizen with regard to the proposal. We um, just can't debate. <laughs> that's right. Well, we, we're doing our debating now at this open meeting, so. And it isn't even a debate on something that's within our jurisdiction to decide. What we can do is what has been suggested. At least put the communication together that we don't feel approving of this is in the best interest of the town unless it contains uh, an affordable housing component of units, of those new units proposed, a percentage of those being affordable housing units. That, that I think we have a consensus on. At least 20%. At <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think we should. Right. Okay. Uh, that's what the consensus is right. going to be. I, I do think that we have a consensus on that too, Mr. O'Leary. Is that sure. is that an accurate statement? I, I would just go one floor, 13 units, 13 units, 52. That's a little over 20%. Yeah. Make it simple. I think it's probably easier to to to. to Whatever they want to do it. Yeah, if we're going to send the communication, it's going to be respectful of the other board's responsibility and role here, and as well as you know, this is what we think should happen here. Yeah. Um, I'm suggesting go, 25 percent, which is 13 units, which is one floor, which makes it easier for them to think about. So I don't, um, it's not on for, it was really on for a discussion. Now where we've moved it forward to something more than a discussion where we're going to act as a board. So do, do I have a motion with regard to that? Mr. Gilberto. Madam Chair, thank you. I, I would just clarify that there may be um, requirements regarding the placement of affordable units um, and uh, whether or not they're able to be all placed on one floor, for example, so perhaps the percentage route would be the appropriate route to follow and just leave it up to them to make it work right. as ever, however they see fit. That was one of my notes that I forgot to mention. Right. They could have affordable units on the first floor of the building. Their buildings haven't been built yet. So, yeah. you know, it it's in the context of these buildings and, and so, do I need a motion for this or because we have a consensus on doing this that we can have the letter sent as soon as possible? You want a motion? I don't think there's one in the packet, but no, I, do, but, uh, I so do think collectively as a board, it's on the agenda. We, we, we do want to speak our piece as to what we believe is in the best interest of the town. 
and we do have a consensus that what's in the best interest, if this is granted, if this variance is granted, it should be based upon a proposal that incorporates 20% of the units being affordable housing units. Okay. And that is a message that we as a board want to convey to the other board that's entertaining the permitting request for, to, for variance, they need relief to be able to build the extra floor. Well, Mr. Wallace said 25%, which would be 13, but. <laughs> and 20 is, um, hold on, let me, okay, I, I got the chip. I've learned from Mr. O'Leary, he's really good at uh, winging uh, the, uh, the motions. I mean, it's experience, right? I mean, I usually mess up the ones that are written, so I'm gonna try here. So, uh, Madam Chair, I move to request that Pulte Homes uh, make 20% of their additional 52 units affordable and a communicate to the ZBA during their deliberations. How about if I give it a shot? Mm -hmm. Please. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, I move that the Board of Selectmen. Select Board. The select Board, excuse me. You know, <laughs> show my age and uh, I move that the Select Board. Um, send an advisory letter to the Zoning Board of Appeals regarding Pulte uh, Properties request for a variance that it is not, that the board does not consider to be in the town's best interest to uh, allow the variance. The town's best interest to, to, to um, agree with the request unless at least 20% of the additional units are affordable. Motion by Mr. O'Leary. Second. Second by Mr. Studo. Any further discussion? Just don't ask me to re. re <laughs> it's okay. That was exactly <laughs> what. That's exactly what we needed. And that motion and that just for further discussion. That would be a communication not during their deliberations. That would be a communication sent as soon as it's prepared to- um, To the Zoning Board of Appeals. Zoning right? Board, as well as Pulte. It's a copy of that should go to Pulte before the meeting in the hopes that they'll consider incorporating that into their proposal, right? Okay, so motion by Mr. O'Leary, second by Mr. Studo. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Mr. Studo. Oh, Mr. Waller, we, I apologize. Mr. Just, Waller. Should we copy CPC as well? I don't know what, exactly what the role is, but should we copy CPC as well? Yes. Thank you. That's all I would add. Thank you. Mr. Okay. Studo. Ms. Gon Mrs. Gonzalez have something before? Oh, I'm, I, I apologize, Mrs. Gonzalez. I didn't see your hand up. I'm just trying to rethink that motion. It was already seconded though, but um, I'm thinking if the words, if they would consider could be in there just to buffer it a little and not make it sound demanding. No, our position is that we don't deem it to be in the town's best interest unless there's the, the affordable aspect to it. And the, and the ZBA can take whatever action they want. Yeah. All right. Just, all right. I don't know if you're going to get a consensus on your amendment, Mrs. Gonzalez. Okay, no, that's fine. So, I mean, we can vote on it, but if you want to withdraw the request to amend it, I, I think as as written, it it needs to have a bit of okay. I'm trying to rehear it. I I was just mulling it in my head. We don't want the we don't want Pulte to just consider it and throw the paper away. We want Pulte to come to the hearing prepared to say we're willing to make X amount of these proposed units affordable housing units. Okay. So I think it needs the oomph that Mr. O'Leary is asking for it to have, um, which is albeit a little bit less oomph than Mr. O'Leary wanted it right. to be written with. However, I'm good. It needs to have some sort of, you know, strength to it because we're, we, we, we were the board that considered the art, uh, put out, we were the board that considered all the responses to the RFP and that was the one that was accepted and now it's you know being modified. So I think we, we do need to have something that has a bit of strength to it. 
more than a bit of strength to it. All right, so we have motion by Mr. O'Leary, second by Mr. Studo. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. Studo. Aye. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Manu Pelli is aye. Okay. Mr. O'Leary, thanks for the save on that one. I mean, I tried. Thank I don't know. Thank you for your, thank you for the, your input. Thank you for spending the time on the issue. I appreciate it. Hmm. All right, so we're going to move on to our next order of business, which is to amend policy 1.21 alcohol licenses server training programs, our first reading of the amended policy. And we're joined by Amy Lutzkowitz, who has been instrumental in helping us to consider these policy revisions. And I'm going to just start off with you, Amy, if there's anything you'd want to add to this. Go ahead. Sure, let me just give a little context. Um, at the end of the last presentation on alcohol server training audits, I had outlined uh, two specific recommendations to update policy 1.21 regarding alcohol server training program requirements, as well as some um, updated verbiage. Uh, first, I recommended that evidence of the certification must be kept available on hand for audit at all times. This could be the actual certificate, a copy, or even a digital image of the certificate. I've had um, people show me pictures on their phone and that's fine. Uh, the second policy change is the elimination of the 30-day window for certification. And I recommended that servers not be allowed to take orders nor serve alcohol until the completion of the certificate. And I just wanna note that in uh, preparing all of these recommendations, we thought about pros, cons, and even the costs related to these measures. Um, and it may appear that some of it poses a bit of a hardship on the business, especially that 30 day window closure. But I think in the long run, it actually helps businesses in two major ways. And the first is to reduce their liability of serving underage customers by ensuring their servers are properly trained before they work independently. Um, the previous 30 day window actually increases the risk of improper serving by untrained staff. And second, it allows managers to easily self audit and reduce their non-compliance by having certificates on hand. And I thought about the cost and time associated with these changes, so I wanted to highlight a couple of points. Um, I propose that the training be a condition of employment similar to the choke save and even allergen awareness certificates that most places are required to have. Like those trainings, it's time well spent to reduce risk. In addition, the proposed policy change will still allow people to work, just not without supervision until properly educated in an alcohol server training program. Um, Similar to how employees in a restaurant might shadow someone, this is still permissible as long as the mentor takes the order and does the actual alcohol service until the person is properly trained. In many ways, this is additional real world training and strengthens the education. Um, also, uh, just for information, um, the course is now widely available online with comparable costs um, to in-person trainings. Most courses take two to four hours and you can start and stop the trainings at um, your convenience. So um, I do believe uh, Mr. Guerrero offered some suggested uh, track changes with the original policy. So if anybody has any questions, please let me know. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Oh, Mr. Uh, first, Mr. Gilberto. <laughs> please, Mr. Gilberto, then Mr. O'Leary. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. So for the board members on page 20 of your meeting packet is a uh, redlined version. What we did there is take the existing server training program policy, um, uh, I believe it's article one, section 21, and we uh, marked it up with some strike through and some redlining language that I've reviewed with Amy and which she uh, agrees would um, put into place the recommendations she has identified um, so if you want to review that for the board's reference, we also wrote a motion, um, which would allow that to be um, given its first approval without requiring us to fully read every letter of the policy, um, should the board feel that it, it's in agreement on it. Okay, Mr. O'Leary, question? Yeah, just I had some input from a couple of establishments when this was originally discussed what, two or three meetings ago. And, and one of the concerns was in our current policy that, um, let me just read it here. It says uh, all individuals, let me see, all individuals who are involved in taking orders and serving alcoholic beverages or selling of alcoholic beverages in retail selling shall be required to have completed an approved certified 
server training program prior to working, except that servers shall be uh, allowed 30 days to complete the program when first working as a wait person. Part of the concern that was expressed to me by some of the, a couple of the establishments was that uh, not everybody does well with on online training and that they actually have in-house training that they bring in when they have uh, uh, new workers. And that because of the uh, uh, inability of some individuals to, to, to uh, learn or test well online, that this, they prefer, some of the establishments prefer to bring in-house training in to get the, give the certification and that this 30 day thing really assists them in, in getting people well-trained on a timely basis. Uh, this is for the servers and on a timely basis. And what, what we're proposing here is to eliminate that, not eliminate, but uh, limit the option of someone coming to work and serving without having the ability to, to bring a trainer in, in-house. I don't, I don't know if there's some other compromise that you could offer, Amy, or, or there's no need to compromise. It's so just a comment. But those were the feed, that was yeah. the feedback I got from at least a couple of establishments. I, I'm one of those people that doesn't train well over, over the internet. I'm definitely much better. I've taken both classes. I should, I should mention that I've done the online. And then just from my own experience, I took the in-house one, uh, the in-person one, I should say. And I definitely found that one to be more effective. Um, my best case scenario is that they do both, but within, you know, a very limited time. So again, that person can still work, but alongside someone who is trained properly. And then if that window happens, you know, uh, if they can't get somebody in for say 31 days, it really won't matter because that person won't be unsupervised. So that's my best case scenario. My, my biggest concern is that somebody who is untrained in how to recognize not just underage alcohol, I, I want to remind everybody, this training also deals with how to manage over-serving people. Um, you know, and that's something that NRPD has to respond to when, when they have a DUI call. Um, so I would prefer all of the above, but that window really concerns me of leaving somebody untrained. You know, think about, uh, you have to be 18 to serve alcohol. Imagine if, if you're 18 year old or 19 year old Overserve somebody and something happened to that person and had no training. You know, I, I think it does a disservice to the train to the servers as well. I'm all about giving them as much information as they want, but I, I understand the concern, Mr. O'Leary. I'm one of those people that doesn't train as well online. Thank but, you, Mrs. Lutzkowitz. Do so, I have any other comments or questions from my colleagues? Just so, would, would there be no offer, Mr. Of O'Leary? Yeah, would there be any other offer of compromise as far as um, hiring a new against more? directed towards servers rather than, uh, you know, some working in the Packer store, I suppose. Um, I think my, my compromise would be to say, you can definitely work, but you just have to be supervised by somebody who's trained with them, shadowing them and not take the, not take the, I don't want to it not work. I want people to work, especially in this COVID environment, you know, in, in this economic environment. So um, I would just, I guess that is my compromise is to say you can work, but somebody has to take the order that is trained. Um, I don't know why any restaurant would want somebody who is untrained to, to take an order or serve. So that, you, that is my compromise. Thank you, Mrs. Lotzkowitz. Um, do, do any other, any other questions of Mr. Walner? Yeah, just, um, just for my own information, maybe others. Um, when we're starting to get into the whole alcohol licenses, we've learned, you know, in the background is the ABCC, right, who can potentially be the appeal people. As we write this kind of language, is this innovation? Has town council looked at this? Are we kind of hitting best practice for what's going on in the state? Um, I, I, I don't know how much we're going on in the limb or how much is, is standardized. So I'm just trying to get into read for where that might be at. Mr. Gilberto? We don't customarily ask town council to review draft policies unless there's a, a significant, you know, legal concern. You know, in terms of you know where this policy would stand relative to things statewide, I, I think that I would hope that we are a bit ahead of the curve, so to speak, of what's happening in other communities uh, because of the fact that we have uh, the benefit of a dedicated substance abuse um, program and substance abuse grant coordinator in Amy. Um, Madam Chair, through you, I would need to defer to Amy just for her perspective from the circles that she travels in to better, to probably better provide Mr. Wallner the information he's asking for. 
I think sure, it's I'll important come. for us to take a look at the language of the policy first. I, I need to hear from my colleagues to see if the modifications that are being proposed is something that my colleagues are, um, I, I'd like to get some dialogue going with the board members about the policy changes. I understand Mr. Wallen wants to know if the the lawyers reviewed it, but I think let's, I'd like to hear from the, my other colleagues with regard to the strike throughs and the proposed changes first. And then we can, you know, maybe bounce some more questions off of Mrs. Lutzkowitz. But at, at this point, the board is the policy responsible for creating the policy around this. I myself have some comments about the strike through that I have a problem with. But if my other colleagues don't have any problems, I'll go ahead and tell you my issues with it. Um, but I, I was just trying to be mindful of allowing my colleagues to, to make any comments about the policy as it's been stricken and as the additions have been made. So does anyone else have any comments with regard to the policy? Mr. Studo? Um, I'd like to actually hear what you were gonna say first, if that's okay. I'm trying to, I'm trying to get everybody's opinion in here just because it's sure. like- Sure, I think it's a huge mistake if you take a look at the, the redlining. I think it's a huge mistake to remove prior to licensing or approval of any change of management. We're the license granting authority. It's on us to ensure that the people that we're handing out these liquor licenses to are properly certified. It doesn't take much, and we know this from Mrs. Lutzkowitz, it doesn't take much to get tips training. All of us can do it in a matter of two hours online. Whether you're good or bad at the online training doesn't matter. If it's important for any establishment with a liquor license here to have trained staff, we know this and we've seen this now. We've had more than one show cause hearing with more than one establishment, especially during the times that these establishments have been um, you know, subject to these kind of, I guess, sting operations, you could say. So I don't see the purpose of why the board is gonna go ahead and strike that language in the first paragraph. I do see the point based on what Mrs. Lutzkowitz is saying um, why we need the, to incorporate in at the time of license renewal proof that anyone on your staff has this certification in place. We can catch it at the time that we're issuing the license. We can catch it at the time an establishment says we need a change of manager, but we can also catch this lack of TIP certification at the time of the license renewal. So I can see the the benefit to incorporating that in. Um, and I can understand why we struck out, except service shall be allowed 30 days to complete the program when first working as a weight person. You have to have TIP certification to serve an alcoholic beverage. Get the proper training in place before you serve in the beverage. So I can see why we struck the 30 days, but I don't see why we struck at the time of licensing. I think it's our obligation to make sure of that. I think we would be behind other towns and communities if we struck that language. Um, I don't know if anyone do, anyone else has any comment or call. Mrs. Gonzalez, are you all set? I completely agree with what you're saying, but I'm interested in hearing um, what Amy has to say in response Ms. to that. Ms. Mr. Mrs. Mrs. Lutzkowitz. Go ahead. I think I think, thank you. I think that that was struck. So it didn't indicate that that was the only time that you were required to do it. Um, it was, you know, kind of meant to be a continuous thing and that that language just needed to be updated. One of the things that I didn't mention is that I did prepare a tool that would be included in the licensing packet that is a roster um, template so that we would make sure that that does occur at time of licensing as well. And that that would be embedded into the, the updated applicant um, application, excuse me. Um, so I think that that verbiage was just struck so that it didn't indicate that you would only need to do this prior to licensing or approval to any change management. It should be an ongoing um, process, which is exactly why we have everybody review this. Right, I, because I think as struck, it changes it changes that entirely versus keeping it in and at the end, re, it should read prior to licensing or approval of any change of management or at the time and at the yeah. time of license renewal. Thank That's you. how it should read. Shouldn't be removed. I understand. Because removing it eliminates the requirement at the time of licensing or at the time of you know change of manager. Um, Mr. Mr. O'Leary. 
I concur with you, Madam Chair. I, I, again, I think it's not just a time of renewal and time of change of manager. It should be an ongoing rolling process that could be checked without sending in an underage person too. In other words, just send someone in to double check to see who's on their payroll, who's serving what functions, and are they certified. And it just should be in a rolling process. So I, I concur that there's no need. I, I think it would be watering it down if we didn't, if we did strike the uh, the first strike through on the, the first. And then are you in a concurring that we could just add and at the time of renewal and at the time of renewal? Sure, yep. Yeah. I don't think that's you know, at the uh, top as well as at the yeah. At I don't the think it's, I don't think it's a, a, a burdensome from the application standpoint for them to know who's on their roster, who's on their payroll, and who's supposed to be certified to do things, and they need to provide that information to us. I have no problem with that. I think it's good. Think and the rest of the language that's proposed there, based on Mrs. Lutzkowitz's input. Again, my only. Uh, issue was raising the concerns of a couple of establishments that were raised with me in relation to uh, their ability to get people done on this timely basis. And, you know, and if it's, un, if, it, if it's uh, not, if they're not able to comply with it, and again, I, I don't see it as, as overly burdensome, but if they're unable to comply with it, then nobody should be serving unless and until they're certified and they should be monitored by someone who is. So, okay, I'm good. Good, okay. All right, Mrs. Gonzalez, oh, Mr. Mr. O'Leary, did you raise your hand? Again? You I mean, Mr. Gilberto. Mr. Gilberto, we, okay. I did not, know. Mrs. Gonzalez, any further comment on the, the red line? I'm, I'm very comfortable with it. Um, I like the fact that um, Ms. Luskowitz added in that they could shadow. If they don't have the certification yet, they can they can still be serving. They can still be making money. They just can't bring the drink right from the bar to the table. Uh -huh. Somebody else would do that for them. Yes, yes, Mrs. Mrs. Lutzkowitz, you're muted. You got your mute. I just wanted to add um, a couple of things. The, you know, all these recommendations came after doing three rounds of compliance checks. Um, you know, as I've been assigned by by this board. Um, and I want to get back to the TA's question about um, are we being, you know, progressive and ahead of the curve on this uh, and kind of ties into Mr. Walner's question. And I never got to uh, really address that. Sorry. So we are uh, a bit ahead of the curve. And that is a direct result of two things. The first, you, you all assigning me to do audits. This really would not, I wouldn't have discovered this problem um, had it not been for assignment. Um, and the second is, you know, this is my full time job is to make these recommendations. Um, I do know that other communities that have DFC grants in them are looking at policies like this. You know, COVID has really shut down all of our in-person um, in person programming. So it's really forced us to use our time wisely by carefully looking at policies uh, that, you know, not necessarily promote drinking, but just leave people at risk. And so this is what, you know, I've used my time for. And other communities are going to be probably looking at us for <laughs> Uh, to see how it's going in North Reading related to this policy. Uh, of course, because of the ACC, you know, all towns have this requirement of being trained, but we would be pretty ahead of the curve in, in closing that 30-day window if other towns have that. That uh, I can't speak to whether they do or not. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any other, Mr. Wong, any other follow-up questions uh, with regard to that? No, I just want to kind of get a get a read of where we are sure. and I appreciate it. I appreciate innovation. Just that we also have to be careful we don't go too far away to put ourselves in peril by doing so. So um, but I like innovation. I think it's good. What about with respect to the policy itself and the changes? I think what you said was pretty damn good in my mind. So okay. let's leave it alone. <laughs> Mr. Wall and Mr. Studo. I agree with everything we said. I have Nothing to add. All right. So if, if I can get the consensus for the second reading, we're going to not leave that strike through in. We're going to unstrike that strike through in the first paragraph and add in an and at the time of renewal. And with all the other changes at the second reading, we'll, we'll be seeing this with all the other changes incorporated in. Is that 
<laughs> do I have a yeah, motion consensus on that? Yeah, May I ask a clarifying question? Sure, of course. Okay, so prior to licensing of approval of any, uh, excuse me, and, and approval of any change in management and upon hiring? Okay, thank you. No problem. And we're going to incorporate some language in relation to the shadowing somewhere. Amy, I don't know where you would insert it. You know, I, the I can draft that, yes. Okay, so for second reading, second reading something with regard to participating but not serving until tips trained, right? Because we struck out the 30 days to get trained while wait, wait while serving. And that's probably where I would put it in, Mr. O'Leary. Okay. Yeah, All right, Thank so you. at the second reading, we'll see that change as well. So those two changes. We're in, in agreement on that. I don't think we do we have a vote on that. I think the vote was just to waive reading of the Paul. Of, uh, we should have just read it because we it talked said, about it. It said to approve the first reading of the amended policy, but maybe I can just change it to approve the second reading. Well, we haven't had the second reading yet. Oh, we have to see. Okay, oh. I see. Okay. So I guess the motion we could entertain would be to waive the reading of the. Actually, I don't think there'd be a motion. Okay. <laughs> Only because next meeting we should have something we're going to agree on. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, also, I'm going to repeat this. I said it, and I know my colleague said this to you at our last meeting that you attended, that we really appreciate not just the work you're doing on the ground, in and out of these establishments, giving information, passing things out, but also coming back to us and giving us work to do to modify these. And, and it's a direct result of you and your work, and certainly Chief Murphy as well, that we're making these modifications that, is, that are for the benefit of the public and for public safety, absolutely. So we thank you for everything you do for us. Thank you very much. I, I'm part of a really big team. And I, you know, we have wonderful volunteers on this team too. So thank you very much. Yes, we appreciate it. Okay. So we're all set. Mr. Gilberto, we're going to move on. We don't need a motion on that, right, Mr. Gilberto? <laughs> thank you, right. Mrs. Lockwood. Thank you. Right. We're going to move you, on. Buddy. Good night. We're going to move on to our next order of business discussion trash recycling program for FY 2022 and beyond. So we're gonna go to either Mrs. Gonzalez or Mr. Mr. Gilberto first. Mr. Gilberto, want us to kick it off and then we'll move on to Certainly. Mrs. Gonzalez. Certainly, thank you, Madam Chair. And I don't mean to uh, disrupt the flow of the agenda, but uh, we do have the um, Acting Public Works Director, Mr. Deming here with us this evening. And there, there is a matter that's come up over the past couple of days that I do want to call to the board's attention while the director is here, which is the condition of the um, Park Street Bridge located um, right near the intersection between Park Street and Winter Street, Route 62, um, near the dance studio uh, for a point of reference. Um, so I'm going to ask through you, if you don't mind, just stepping aside from this agenda item while we have them here, just a quick update, because it is going to have an impact on the community, both financially and um, in terms of traffic this week. Mr. Deming, welcome. Tell yeah. us the bad news. Uh, the bad news is it won't be that expensive to fix. That's, uh, right now. that's actually good news. That's good news. Um, so uh, MassDOT inspects our bridges once a year. Um, they identified that that bridge that goes over Martin Brook on Park Street, um, there's a section that's got significant damage to it. Uh, the good news with where it's damaged is it's not impacting where cars are traveling right now. Um, if anybody's been by there in the last few days, they'll notice we put some cones out just to keep cars kind of off the gutter. Um, so we had a, uh, we had a meeting uh, Friday morning with a structural engineer and a company that does these type of emergency repairs. Um, they drafted up a plan over the weekend and uh, they gave us the, you know, they let us know today that they can come out Wednesday and fix it. Um, I, don't, I wasn't expecting it to be turnaround time that quick, but I think we got pretty lucky. 
Um, so Wednesday from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Park Street in between Winter Street and Main Street is going to be closed down while they do the repairs to the bridge. They anticipate everything to be done and uh, for the area that needs to be reconstructed to be paved uh, by 6 p.m. Okay, so the $24,000 question is how much are the repairs going to cost the town? And the I estimate that they gave us was $28,000. Oh my God, you were almost right on the money there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. As, as, oops, sorry, go ahead. Mr. Demi, you believe that that's a reasonable, that's a reasonable estimate for the services that are going to be provided on an emergency basis too. Yes, 100%. I've, I've never built a bridge before, but I was very surprised when, uh, when I saw that estimate. Okay. Uh, as some of you might know, that bridge has been requested through a Mass DOT grant for several years now to be replaced uh, for them to supplement repair costs to the town. Um, it, we were formally denied the grant in uh, 17, 2017 and 2018. Since then, they have not given out the grant. Um, so we haven't received the denial letter because they haven't granted it to anybody. Um, the engineers from Mass DOT um, have told us that now that the bridge is in worse shape than it was before, it should help to bump us up on that repair list. Um, but, you know, one of the big things to keep in mind is I believe that grants for $500,000. And I believe the original estimate to repair that bridge was somewhere between $800,000 and um, $1.5 So uh, it's definitely coming down the pipeline. Uh, we're hoping to to try to keep that bridge up, you know, with until we can get the uh, assistance from Mass DOT to replace the entire thing. Mr. Mr. O'Leary. Just my recollection is, is that uh, we've been denied over the past several years because the span of the bridge is just shy of the span required for consideration. And again, I don't know if it's been any modification and uh, again, it's been a couple of three years since I've been on the Capital Improvement Planning Committee and actually traveled down to that bridge and went down and looked at it and all the rest and see what it is. But I mean, it, it, it's a substantial cost to the town that we're facing in relation to replacing the bridge and it's sooner rather than later. And we were hoping to get some sort of uh, state assistance, but because of the, the span of it, the, the, the length of it, it's we may be denied. Is that still the case, you know, Mr. Gilberto or, or Chris? Uh, from, from what I had heard uh, recently from interactions with the Mass DOT engineers was just that, uh, you know, there's, there's a bunch of bridges in every single city in town and we're just on a list. Um, the engineer that we met with the other day had said that the replacement plan for that bridge was not to, was to remove the bridge deck that's there, but the pilings that are in place underneath would actually stay and they would more or less build the new bridge on top of it. But, uh, I'm not sure if that has anything to do with Mass DOT's uh, uh, approval situation. Mr. Gilberto. Mr. Gilberto. So I, I will just add that the, uh, the funding program that's out there for this bridge is unique because of its size. It's not an uh, annually capitalized funding program. It's sort of intermittently capitalized. And so we have a, a grant application that is uh, with the state. It dates back a few years. We initially applied probably 10 or more years ago at this point, but we're not funded because of the bridge's condition. So we'll continue to work to try to get that um, um, moved up the list with Representative Jones, who has been in regular communication with us throughout the yeah, throughout my tenure, at least with regards to the, this grant program. Um, you know, and that would be for a more substantial reconstruction that was described by Mr. Deming. Right now, we're focused on a short-term repair and making sure we get the bridge uh, safe for, tra uh, for travel uh, across all lanes and the gutter. Um, just wanted to make folks aware that there's gonna be an impact on um, Wednesday of this week for the day. Secondly, that there will be uh, an impact financially, whether we end up moving to fund this out of the chapter 90 program, which we believe would be an eligible use, whether it's gonna need to be a reserve fund transfer that we need to request from the finance committee. I do see Ms. Robert is here this evening. Just wanna make folks aware Kind of a late breaking issue that's happened over the past couple of days with the dollar amount coming into play today. Um, there really isn't any action for the select board to take, but whether we all are all, all are here together and this will have an impact, I wanted to make you aware. Yes, thank you. I was going to ask you where where we cover in the twenty eight thousand from. So it, it'll initially come out of the DPW's operating budget, most likely. Um, it may need to come out of the Chapter ninety if there isn't sufficient funding in place there. 
Um, and uh, then, you know, the, the, the custom of the finance committee has been, you know, when we get to the end of the year, um, if there's a, a, a deficit, you know, that they would assist at that point in time. And I assume it would probably be handled similarly if we don't do chapter 90. Okay. Yes, so we need to be remain cognizant of the fact that we're, we're facing a, you know, a million dollar project here, uh, potentially with no funding. Um, so it should be on everybody's radar screen. <clears throat> Madam Chair, thank you for the opportunity to update folks on that. I know it was not on the agenda, but where the director was here. Um, we will, uh, I will, we're going to provide an update on snow and ice, but the hour is a bit later than I was anticipating. So I'll do that in the town administrator's report, which is a quick update. Okay. Um, yes. But through we you, Madam Chair, we could. Thank you and everybody in your department, Mr. Deming, for the amazing job that they've been doing, keeping the roads clear for us in this, in our February storms. Thank you. While you're here, so mm -hmm. uh, I mean, do, I know that that was an emergency, but Mr. I don't know if there's anything you want to add with regard to snow. I know Mr. Gilberto gives us an update, but you're here as well. So, is there anything else you wanted to let us know or add? Or well, while you're I, I think Mike's plan was to update on the budget where we're at. Um, you know, I was looking over, giving him some information today, and I was kind of surprised to see that we've already recorded uh, 54 inches of snow this year. Um, you know, and, and dating back to we had five inches of snow on uh, October 30th. So it's uh, already been kind of a, a long season with a, you know, a couple big storms, one in December and one last week and, you know, more coming in the forecast. Oh, we, we put that October storm out of our minds. That's right. That was right before Halloween. Right. That's right. All right. So, well, thank you. I, I'm sure that I speak on behalf of my colleagues to to thank you and your whole department for everything you're doing to keep the roads clear and working around the clock to get that stuff done. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Deming. Um, Mr. Gilberto, I can tell you have something else to add. Only that um, we, uh, we, as the board knows, we've been discussing the status of the trash and recycling program with the Department of Public Works. Yes. Given a couple of updates over the past few meetings, and I want to thank um, Mrs. Gonzalez for her, her time and her willingness to participate in the conversations, along with Mr. Greenberg from the Recycling Committee, who has also joined us this evening. Um, rather than go through, I, I guess I, Madam Chair, through you, I don't know if Mrs. Gonzalez wanted to add anything. If not, we do have a PowerPoint presentation that I have uploaded to the share file folder for this evening, but Mr. Deming is going to share his screen if that's okay. Yes, of course. That'd be great. Mrs. Gonzalez? No, that's great. We'll we'll go ahead with that. Chris, do you want me to share mine or you got it? Okay. Oh, I got it. I got it. Already. Oh. I should catch it up. So this is uh, our sanitation update. It's, uh, it's going to talk a little bit about the budget, the current contracts and future contracts, and where we stand with the future trash collection rates. So just a little bit of an update. Um, in February of 2020, about a year ago, the town signed an extension um, for its contract with Covanta for a solid waste disposal. Uh, that agreement was was completed with um, eight other towns I believe uh, the, the tipping fee uh, which is the price per ton for disposal of non-recyclable trash um, well, that we pay per ton to get rid of the trash um, for FY22 is actually going to go up uh, substantially to 23 percent um, that's to reflect the current market changes and a four percent increase in FY23 um, sorry, the first one was FY22, 4% uh, in FY23 and another 4% in FY24. Um, so obviously the only thing to keep in mind with that is that's all based off of um, the tonnage. So it can go up and down a little, a little bit per year, but uh, as you can see in the bottom of that chart, um, the last four years are based off uh, estimated tonnage. So the solid waste and collection and recycling, as you all know, JRM has been our um, hauler and in charge of our recycling since I believe the mid 2000s. Um, so the DPW officials, myself, Mark Clark, and town administrator began discussions and negotiations with JRM 
in the fall of 2020 to prepare for our contract, which is expiring at the end of this fiscal year. Uh, JRM proposed a five-year flat rate deal, which does not include cost sharing for recycling. Uh, we were under the impression, and I know uh, Dan Greenberg can definitely comment on this, that everything that we've been seeing in the industry um, was, was kind of leading towards cost sharing uh, based off uh, how much contamin contaminated recycling that we had on a weekly basis. Um, they did not propose that in the contract. Uh, since then, myself, Mark Clark, the town administrator, uh, Dan Greenberg, and um, Ms. Gonzalez have met. Um, we've had several meetings on this. We've looked at a few different options going forward for the town, and we all agree that what JRM has proposed for a five-year deal is uh, certainly a great deal for the town of North Reading. So the deal that we've been able to negotiate with them is a five-year deal with a 0% increase in FY22, a 3% increase in FY23, 3% increase in FY24, 3.5% in FY25, and another 3.5% in FY26. So that would be a 13% increase over five years. Like I said, uh, no increase for this year. And uh, just to keep in mind that our contract with JRM has not increased over the past three years. So we've been paying that 835,000 for the past three years. This will be the fourth year. One of the other things that I just wanted to mention that I think um, people sometimes lose sight of in the uh, sanitation budget is all the other, I call them extras that go into the budget. Um, you know, a lot of these have to do with the household hazardous waste day, um, the special collection day that we do every year, but it also goes into, um, you know, the leaf pile, the compost pile down at the DBW garage. You know, we now take uh, the brush pile. We have to have that ground up every couple of years, um, all the way down to buying recycling bins and the stickers and all the uh, individual curbside pickups that happen throughout the year. And this final slide is more or less just a breakdown of the projections for the next five fiscal years. Um, one of the things obviously that's going to need to change is the trash fee. Uh, it went up two years ago, I believe, in FY18, or three years ago. Before that, I believe it had been 10 years since the last time that it was raised. Um, you know, I, I don't think the plan right now is to um, propose what that fee is going to be. I think that's something that later on the board's going to have to take action on, but you know, it's, it's definitely uh, going to be something that's going to come up sooner than later. Thank you, Mr. Deming. Questions from my colleagues? Mr. Studo? What is the, um, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to find an old bill here. What is the current trash fee again? It's uh, $68 a quarter. It ends up being $272 a year. Okay. And you said it hasn't been 10 years? It, it was raised in FY18. Um, that's when there was a pretty significant change in the JRM contract when we had gone to uh, more of a flat rate fee for recycling disposal. So it had gone up in FY18 and before that it was 10 years, I believe it was 10 years before it had gone up. Okay. And if I'm reading this correct, you know, that's, you know, just for next year, 7710 would do it for next year anyways. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions, Mr. Studo? No, thank you. Mr. O'Leary. Is, is it the administration's intent to propose something to phase in uh, the increases? Uh, I know there's a 0% increase next year, but you know, you know, a one and a half percent for next year and rather to, to even it out rather than uh, incremental jumps to from, you know, two and a half to three to three and a half percent, you know, the forecasted five year period so we could even it out, start a year earlier and maybe give it a, get it a little more even. Mm -hmm. Mr. Jamie. So I think what you need to remember too is, um, you know, while this, the JRM contract is something new, the, the Covanta contract, which was signed a year ago, this FY22 will be the first year of a pretty significant uh, jump in the disposal rate. So I think um, even though this year there's not, there's a 0% increase for JRM, 
Uh, the fact that we have to deal with the increase for Covanta, there will have to be a, a decent raise this year. And then uh, I believe it's going to be more of the board's decision of, you know, figuring out, do we want to take into consideration year two and three out of this five and only raise it once or raise it twice? Do we have what do we have for surplus in the in the in the account to uh, stabilize rates uh, to effectuate this uh, twenty three percent increase in one year? Do we have any money in the stabilization account for rates to um, to you know to positively impact that? I don't over a period of time instead of doing twenty three percent in one felt swoop, you know, you do a Twelve and a half, or a fifteen, or you know something less, because we have some surplus, and then eat some of the surplus, and then build it back up, and kind of straighten out the curve here, rather than the, the big hump. Mike, do you have the current total? Oh, Mr. Gilberto. Thank you, through you, Madam Chair. So our balance is approximately two hundred thousand dollars in the solid waste stabilization fund right now. So it's something that we certainly can consider as we look at making a recommendation to the board um, uh, in the spring, uh, probably in the early spring, with regard to the rate uh, as we look at the projections. Yeah, I, I just think it's uh, you know it's unfortunate, and again, it's it's out of our control as far as what the market places coming to bear on us in relation to the significant jump in one year. Um, you know, if we could use our stabilization fund to, to help mitigate that impact, and again, still factor in uh, the ability to rebuild the stabilization fund going forward, I think we should consider that. Yeah. We, we did talk, the last time we increased the tax, I don't know if you'll recall this, Mr. O'Leary, I called it a tax fee. <laughs> the last time we increased the fee, that was a Freudian slip. We had talked about how this, the, you know, the change in circumstances with regard to recyclables had caused us to have to look at it, but that we wanted to continue to look at it annually so we didn't have to uh, propose such a large increase all at once. So I think even if it's a zero increase over the year, I think we should be considering what Mr. O'Leary is proposing and, and hear from the town on how we can absorb this over the course of time rather than three, three and a half, three and a half, a huge hit like that. Exactly what Mr. O'Leary is saying. Even if it's a year where we don't see any increase, we want to shore up the reserve so that we can handle the, the increase that it's going to cost the town. And if that requires us to look at this fee and slightly increase it annually, I think that's what the board, that's the tough job the board's going to have to do. So um, would you come back to us with some sort of pro projections with regard to that at our next meeting, uh, Mr. Gilberto? Uh, Madam Chair, yes, uh, we can come back with some projections for you, um, either at the next meeting or perhaps in the discussion relative to the uh, the solid waste budget, which would happen at the Saturday budget hearing. Yes, yes. But we could be happy to go over that, you know, with with folks. And I, I through you, Madam Chair, I, I do want to just comment, and I, and I know Mrs. Gonzalez, you know, she may I don't want to she may want to speak to it as well, but mm -hmm. you know, there is a number of things that are very concerning that are going on out there in the solid waste and recycling industry that we're all very familiar with from our discussions going back over the past three or four years. And, you know, we continue to push very hard on behalf of the townspeople who pay the fees for this service to um, try to keep the, the terms reasonable um, in terms of the, the collection and recycling to avoid some of the penalties that are out there in some communities for contaminated recycling um, um, uh, trucks. So when there's contaminated debris to the point where it becomes, it needs to be disposed of in some other way, there's a penalty that's in place. We do not have that in this contract. Um, we have a sort of a, a flat rate, if you will, that when it went up three years ago, somewhat absorbed the impact of, the, of the, what was going on in the recycling industry at that time. But I think that we find ourselves in a, in a, in a I'm going to knock on wood here, but decent position with regard to the trash recycling component. The, the disposal end of it, um, Mrs. Gonzalez knows this because I think I've shared it with her. I fought really hard over the, the summer and in fact withheld signing off on the agreement with Covanta because I just thought it was so absurd. But uh, in the end, we really do not have anything by way of, uh, of options in terms of the rate. Um, that's another byproduct of 
you know, the increased demand and pressure on the recycling is pushing things to Co Covanta. We've all experienced what happens when the trucks can't finish the collection because of the wait times at Covanta. So I, I just, I want the board to know that we are fighting hard on behalf of uh, the rate payers with regard to this. And, you know, I think all, all of us on the call, including the finance director, you'll recommend what's before you. <clears throat> so any other questions from my colleagues? Just, just another comment in relation to, you know, budgetary standpoint, I, I think we need to, I mean, the, the, the cost of this is, is starting to escalate substantially. Um, you know, it may be a time for us to start looking at um, incorporating some of the costs associated with solid waste disposal recycling, you know, back into the tax rate is, instead of just uh, fee-based, again, it's some sort of a, a hybrid, uh, because what we have is a situation where, you know, some of the, the lower users are, are, are paying an inordinate proportion of the fees associated with the, with the costs and no tax benefit in relation to, you know, getting to write it off on their taxes. And again, not that the, the federal tax laws are already benefit to most people around here because they, with the new tax provisions in 17 and 18, you know, that it caps us, but by the same token, um, you know, more of the shared costs would be shared by the entire community as far as getting rid of the waste. So, and I recognize that it's also going to impact, you know, other services that we provide to the community as a whole. So if you pick up this cost, you know, it's going to, you're going to give somewhere else, but it's getting to the point where it's uh, uh, more than substantial. And I think maybe we should just take a look at it and start subsidizing it through our tax dollars, as opposed to just a fee-based uh, operation. Okay, do I have any other questions or comments from my colleagues? Oh, Mrs. Gonzalez. Thank you. Um, so to speak to Mr. O'Leary, um, I was feeling the same way. Um, I was feeling like this is going up, this is starting to get very expensive. I'm always thinking about the seniors who have very little trash and are, you know, paying the same. So that was kind of my baby. I wanted to kind of really delve into, well, what if we went and just took it away from the town and went privately and let people, you know, choose which company, let's have companies compete. Maybe that will bring the price down and let's let people handle that themselves. And then you could have trash every other week and if you didn't need it every week. Um, so I compared it to a town that does that and got some um, feedback and found out that <laughs> it's much more money. Um, somebody who gets their trash picked up every other week uh, was paying $132. Um, for the quarter. And that's every other week. Um, other people who were having it weekly were like uh, double, like 150. And then they were paying separate for their recycling. So, um, and then Mr. Clark went ahead and went and looked at other towns comparative to ours, and they were higher and they had other things tacked on top. And so what we all found through this was that we're doing all right. I mean, this, this really, we're getting a good deal from JRM right now, even with the prices going up. Um, it made me feel better about it anyway. I mean, we really did do a lot of research. Thank you. Mr. Yeah, Thank you. I'm not disagreeing with, with the methodology yeah. and, and what we're, how we're handling things. It's just a question of how are we paying for it? What are we paying for? The way we're paying for it now is strictly through user fees as opposed to being subsidized through the tax, through the tax rate. So I'm not talking about changing the methodology. And I, again, we've, we've been uh, a beneficiary of, of uh, good negotiations and timing and everything else over the last several years where we are in a better position than most communities in relation to the costs associated with it. It's just a question right now, the user fees are increasing substantially uh, what's going to be proposed substantially. And all I'm saying is maybe we should consider the structure as to how we're paying for it, where we should be subsidizing some of the user fee through the tax dollar, tax rate rather than straight user fees. 
but you know this so I, i'm not suggesting you go private or even look at that because that that's never been a, a viable option you know the, the seniors and the low users were going to pay substantially more always substantially more if they had to go to a private private hall so i'm just saying let's you know let's look at subsidizing the the appropriation uh, through the tax rate rather than totally through user fees. Thank you, Mr. O'Leary. Do any of my other colleagues have any questions or comments? Okay, I just have a question. Was there any consideration or um, discussion about um, a reopener in the event that there, you know, a reopener provision in the contract in the event that there are technological advancements that um, make it more economically beneficial for JRM, sort of shifting it back to where it was originally, where it was more economically beneficial for JRM to do the recycling. Was there any consideration of that? Because there's just different technologies that are being developed and co coming through that might address some of the issues um, with regard to recycling and you know degrading of recycled products and things like that. I think from what we saw um, is that just the trends in the recycling market are you know there's nothing forecasted that it's going to get better and, and you know there's there's definitely that if they were to upgrade the technology and better be able to sort through but uh, JRM has not talked about upgrading their recycling plant right now. Um, part of the deal that we had uh, talked with them was was a lower term at more money. Uh, I think we were able to get some percentage down on the deal by by going a little bit longer. Um, like I said, we looked at this from a lot of different angles and, and we feel that it was definitely the best bet going forward. Any questions? Okay. Is there a vote with with regard to this? No vote. You just wanted to provide us with some information with regard to where this is at. I think for our next meeting, maybe we can address, um, you know, how we're going to absorb the impact of this over the course of time with an increase in the tra tax uh, trash fee and or, you know, considering, I guess we'll give the finance director have a little bit of time to mull over Mr. O'Leary's suggestion that we pay for some of this through the, you know, the tax that we collect. Though, to, in my opinion, that's just going to take away from other other things that we're, we're working on. However, we, we need to give some time, allow the finance director some time to kind of consider that. Um, you come, maybe come back to us with some thoughts on that at our next meeting. There's really no other way to pay for it with the fee unless the fee increases when the cost of the town goes up over time, unless we go along with some sort of, you know, hybrid that Mr. O'Leary is suggesting or, you know, um, you know increase, increase that fee over the course of time to absorb the cost. So we'll maybe have you, if you don't, if you can, if you think you can do that by the next meeting, back to us with, in just in case we're, you know, as a board of mind to take a vote on it sooner rather than later. Um, even Talk though we fee, have, a, I, I think that's important for us to keep on top of that. Yes. Yes. You're speaking to the fee, to the adjustment to the fee. Yes. Right. Okay. I, I don't, I don't hear any Google, Great objection to moving forward with, I don't hear objection to moving forward with JRM under the terms proposed from uh, any members of the board. So, and okay, Miss, Miss Roar, you are you, <laughs> I was going to say that sound advice, but we have no sound. <laughs> we can't hear it. <laughs> Current sound advice without sound. Oh, okay. We lost her. Mr. Greenberg, while we're waiting, Mr. Greenberg, you are muted too. 
Thanks for sitting in and working on this and working out the details. Welcome. Thank, thank you very much. Um, but I think the thanks ought to be directed to the negotiating team, of Mr. Gaberto, Mrs. Gonzalez, and Mr. Deming, who um, this is a subject that's near and dear to my heart. I've been following it for a while. And they have done a tremendous job on behalf of the town. Um, I talk all the time with people in similar positions to mine and other towns and the people at uh, the state level. And uh, this is a great, great deal. Um, do not underestimate the great job that these people have done. And, the, and, the, and in my opinion, the bullet that we have dodged at least for the next period of time that that JRM contract is in place. Um, as people have said, um, the recycling market is extremely volatile and um, what's driving it, as everybody knows, I think by now is three years ago or four years ago, China refused to accept any of our recycling and that threw that market into a tizzy. And right now, those commodities have very little value and that we're not paying extra money for the processing of things like um, colored HDPE, plastic bottles that are colored, that have zero value in the recycling market. Many other towns are paying um, uh, a, a extra price for recycling of that kind of stuff. Uh, glass has no value. Um, this is a tremendous deal. Uh, and they've done a tremendous job. Now, the only other comment I will make in response to Mr. O'Leary's uh, comment, um, if, if, if you shift the cost burden of recycling and trash to the tax base, what you're accomplishing basically is you're shifting some of the cost from the owners of less expensive houses to the owners of more expensive houses. And I'm not saying that that's a bad idea. In fact, I think that's a good idea. There is another concept that you may want to consider. And I've discussed this on several occasions with Mrs. Gonzalez. And that's a, re a return to something that we had many years ago in North Reading called pay as you throw. Where instead of everybody in town paying a flat rate, no matter how much they put out on the curb, you pay in proportion to the volume and weight of what you put out in the curb. And this shifts the cost burden from the low end users who tend to be your seniors, your, your um, uh, empty nesters, your people who don't generate a lot of trash. It shifts the cost burden from them to people who put on a great deal of trash. Now I know in my neighborhood, I have a, a, a my wife and I are here by ourselves. We're empty nesters. We have a lot of singles that live in houses that put out very little. We've got contractors in the area. That's a subject for another day. Contractors who fill their curb with trash and they only pay the same $68 that the woman next door to me pays and she puts out a bag every other week. Um, I'm not a huge fan of pay as you throw. There are some downsides to it but it is a way of shifting the cost burden to those who generate the cost. Just something to consider. And again, just over the years, we've looked at that, and again, I've been involved over the years, but you know, we also found that as you get back to the pay to throw, you also find an awful lot of refuse, which is then dumped in other areas across the town. Oh, and people yeah. complaining about the business hey. dumps being filled by other people. Oh, Lord, yes. And, and absolutely. Yep. Yeah, just I'm not a huge fan. It's just a concept. Yeah. Yep. In the community that I work with, they went to that pay as you throw, and they went to two dollars a bag per week. So you could put out up to two bags, or you could put a dollar bag, one dollar bag, and you had to buy your bags at the local grocery store. And it's you know, for the since the time that it's been implemented, has been nothing but complaints from the residents who have to go get the bags and they have to be blue bags and they have to be bought and they have to, you know, you can, you don't know, fill up as much as you can and 
all the trash cans full of household trash that it increases the cost for the DPW to have to go clear up all the receptacles and you know I can go on and on with that. I, I'm not the wonder, I'm the not wonders of pay as you throw, but I'm sure as a community we've studied that as an option that's not the best option. There is a reason it's why we went away from it. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Correct. Greenberg. Correct. Mr. Mr. Green, Mr. Greenberg. No, I'm just saying I'm we not endorsing it. I'm it. just throwing it out as a concept. And again, all, all I put out there was just the consideration of subsidizing the the, the fee <laughs> through the tax dollars, <laughs> not changing the methodology or the uh, or the universal fee that. No, as I say, that it, you know that has a certain appeal because it shifts the burden to the people who can more afford it. It shares it with everybody, commercial, industrial, everybody. Well, people but they're not even users. I know, but it, it does have that positive impact. Depending upon where you Mrs. are as a community. Okay, <laughs> I, had, I believe Mr. Studo hand raised. Uh, Mr. Studo? I will also share just my experience is the pay as you go. I uh, lived in Malden and um, I can tell you that uh, not only, I, I don't think it may happen here as much, but it got to the point where people would actually steal your blue trash bag and put your black one on the curb. And then you woke up in the morning and your trash was still there because the blue bag was gone. <laughs> so I'm saying that people, yeah, I mean, you will find, yeah, between commercial lots, I, I think it could work. But I think that one suggestion and uh, Chair Manny Pelling, maybe I, I know Malden just instituted this and I know some people have had some experience. You can actually buy a barrel versus the bag that entitles you to X number of trash that you can fill in that barrel. And that seems to be working a little better, but it, it, it's, it's out. So again, I, I agree in general that, you know, I, I think if we could find another way besides going down to Ryers to buy trash bags would probably be better. Mrs. Gonzalez, Mrs. I just want to I just want to say that the bottom line to all the research and all the conversation we've had here um, is that even though we're all paying the same price, the same sixty eight dollars, whether you put in a bag every other week, you're still paying less. Uh, like I said, I compared private with someone who put it out every other week, and they were still paying almost double. Um, so the what we're paying, whether it's dispersed properly, it we're all getting a good deal. Even if you're putting out a bag every other week, $68 is a bargain. So comparative to everyone else around us. So I just feel like that should be out there and people should know that, that if you're gonna compare it anywhere, we're really getting a good deal. And I would like to put, give, the props to Mr. Deming, who's done a lot of work on this, um, and and Mr. Gilberto. Um, I've had some input and I've been along for the ride in the conversations and the meetings, but you know, they're the negotiators. <laughs> but I thank you for that praise, Mr. Greenberg. Thank uh, you. Thank you. All right. So we, oh, Miss, this is Miss Roar. Did you want to add anything to the discussion? I just wanted to say, Madam Chair, that I will work with the administration as well as the interim DPW director um, and Mark Clark, who has a lot of insight um, to uh, look into and evaluate, you know, seeing how we can possibly, you know, um, spread some of the expense around um, if the tax rate can absorb it. Um, I can't guarantee that the tax rate can absorb it for FY22, where, you know, both the municipal and school side have, um, you know, budget constraints and our budgets have, you know, are going to be fi not finalized, but they're going to be submitted um, this coming Friday. So I can't make any promises for that, but we will look in and see what, what can be done um, and if there is anything that can be done for FY22. And then also giving us a plan too over the course of time if yes. we're going to be tackling as a board increasing that fee. I think mm -hmm. if 
I'm, I think that at least two of us would like to do that over the course of time versus, you know, a, a huge increase, you know, what all at once. Correct. Yep. So yep. Gradually. So give us a plan for that. That'd be great. Yes. Okay. We, will, we will, we will work on that. Thank, thank you. you. Well, thank you. And thank you, Mr. Greenberg. And thank you, Mr. Deming. Uh, oh, did anyone else have any, have the hand? All set? Thank you. Thank okay. you. I mean, thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for all the work you're doing on this. And Mrs. Gonzalez to you too as well. And Mr. Gilberto. All right. So we're moving on to our next order of business, which is the common victualers license application for subway for Lowell Road. Madam Chair through you there is a motion in there it's for a new uh new operator of the establishment the subway at four lowell road right at the intersection of route 62 and route 28 uh, um i believe they've been issued their food permit they just need a new common victualler license for the new uh, the new ownership thank you mr gilberto do we have a motion yes madam chair i move to grant a common victualler license to four paths llc dba subway number 27658 to expire December 31st, 2021, subject to all regulatory department requirements. Motion by Mr. Studo. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Gonzalez. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Mr. O'Leary. Aye, and I wish them well. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. And Manu Pali is aye. Next order of business is appointment to the Veterans Event Committee. Um, Mrs. Gonzalez, you want to speak to this? Um, yes. So we have three incumbents who um, have volunteered to continue on with the committee. So um, I am happy to vote them in and thank them for their commitment and to and for com continuing their commitment. And hopefully we have another, a new member that we voted in um, in a past meeting. Um, and I, I'm hoping that there'll be some new spirit to it and, and they're all excited about it. Okay, thank you. Do we have a motion, Mr. Strudel? Yes, Madam Chair, I move to place the following names and nomination for reappointment as associate members to the Veterans Event Committee for terms to expire December 31st, 2023. Mark Manzelli, Kimberly Manzelli, Kenneth Ravioli. Did you say associate? Yeah, it says it in the motion. Mm -hmm. Mr. Gilbert, I are, are they supposed to be associate? I thought they were full members. Madam Chair, uh, through you, Madam Chair, Ms. Gonzalez, I, I believe that they're also regular members. Yeah, they are. As well. Um, I can pull up the town clerk's online system very quickly to confirm that if we want. I'm also realizing we did not put the citizen activity forms in the packet, so I apologize to the board for that. I do not believe these were contested appointments, though, um, Mrs. Gonzalez, no. am I correct? They're not. No, they're not. They're incumbents, um, and I'm sure that they're, okay. they're not associates. So just members. Don't okay. shoot the reader. Great. Yeah. Regular members, so we're going to do that, withdraw that motion and redo it? I'll just say members, correct? Um, oh. Madam Chair, through you. I, I'm looking on the town clerk's website for the Veterans Events Committee and it's indicating that there are five regular members and five associate members and they all appear to be the individuals listed. I, I'm, Mrs. Gonzalez, I'm looking, I don't see any regular members who have come off on here, it, although it looks like, I'm sorry, there's one one vacant seat for a term that expires in November of 2023. So Can we table this and get this straightened out? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I yeah. think that's a 
wise wise recommendation so all right so we'll hold off until we can square away why we have these why we're we're what we need to know about that all right so we're moving on to legal bills mr studo madam chair i move to approve legal bills for december 2020 in the amount as follows general 716630 labor 4329 20 Elm, 267150 for a total of 14,166.73. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo. Second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Manu Pelli is aye. Next order of business is the town administrator's report. Mr. Gilberto. Madam, Madam Chair, through you, a couple of items to report. One is that, excuse me, my computer's frozen here. First is that the town planner is working with the town of Reading and the Reading North Reading Chamber of Commerce for an application to the state for a state travel and tourism recovery grant. Uh, it would be a proposal where the chamber would be the uh, applicant and the contracting agency with support from the two towns. Um, the programming proposed would be um, for supporting local business through marketing efforts, including social media, direct mail, and creation of a website to promote and provide information about local businesses. Um, the promotional aspect of it would be handled by the, the chamber rather than the town, but the towns would be providing some support uh, as needed on the project. That's something that's going to uh, be due for application at the end of this week, and I believe that the chamber will submit that. It will probably submit a letter of support for the application on behalf of the town. Um, in that same area, I'm also pleased to report the town has been awarded a $35,000 grant from the Massachusetts Office on Disability to complete an ADA self-evaluation and transition plan, which is uh, sort of the first step in um, uh, outlining the steps so that the town needs to take overall to ensure compliance with our public uh, <laughs> infrastructure um, in terms of dis um, access, uh, uh, access for disabled persons. The final thing is, uh, as the um, DPW director um, mentioned, we have a, um, we've had a, a busy winter, as folks know, and I wanted to provide an update with regard to the expenditures. So we annually appropriate $175,000 um, in the snow and ice budget. Um, we have exceeded that, uh, that appropriation with uh, costs expended through today, uh, totaling $298,630 with some um, costs associated with yesterday's storm, but not the overtime costs um, for DPW personnel included in it. So we, uh, we have exceeded the budget and we're now into the, um, the, um, the reserve, if you will, that we carry as part of our financial plan, which I believe for fiscal year 2021 was um, $350,000. And so um, we're into that number now um, to the tune of about $125,000 using round number. Um, for those who are watching and don't know, the, the town is authorized under state law to deficit spend for snow and ice removal. We do plan for that um, in our budgeting. And what we do is plan to carry over the, uh, the, the deficit into the following fiscal year. And we do so on an annual basis. Um, and it's a means to avoid, um, to, to maintain the ability to carry over that deficit uh, under, uh, under state law. Um, with regard to that, DPW has done a great job with regard to snow and ice, uh, as we discussed earlier. I do want to thank um, Mr. Deming, um, the individuals down at the garage, uh, and our contractors, particularly those contractors who might be newer and have signed on and joined the team over the past couple of years, as we've um, seen some folks um, move on to other um, to, to the Department of Transportation or maybe to move away from the the the, um, the, uh, the work of snow plowing. So. That's the update. Um, probably no surprise that we've exceeded the budget at this point based upon the winter we've had. Um, it, we seem to, we always get there somehow, whether it's a, a bunch of small storms with a lot of uh, salting and sanding going on or, or a few big storms like we've had this winter. Um, but uh, we are still within the, uh, the buffer, if you will, for carryover expenses. And more snow. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> and more snow tomorrow. <laughs> Any questions for Mr. Gilberto? 
All set. Okay, so we're going to move on to old and new business. Mr. O'Leary. Rare occasion. I'm all set. All right, Mr. Studo. I'm writing this date down. <laughs> <laughs> nothing. Studo. I have Mrs. nothing. Mrs. Gonzalez. No, I've done all my trash talk. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Walner. Um, I'm just wondering, we agreed to write a letter, but we didn't talk about this is new business. Who's going to write the letter to the ZBA and CPC? Didn't we? Didn't we? Did, oh, you're right. We never decided. Didn't we, didn't we assign that to Mr. Gilbert? <laughs> I think yeah, we so. did. That was my I assume so. <laughs> <laughs> I did assume so. Like, like, yeah, I did assume so. On behalf of the board. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I intended to write it, it as a memorandum. Clear, yeah. It was a pretty clear directive of what what should be in that letter. So, okay. All right. Okay. I didn't and if I that. write it, I'm going to write it strongly like Mr. O'Leary suggested, which I know is not the consensus. So we'll leave it to the professional, Mr. Gilberto. And uh, if the board, if it's the board's pleasure, I'd certainly be happy to sign it on behalf of the board. Okay, great. Thanks. That was the only thing I was thinking about for new business. I didn't hear that. And do we have board member reports, Mr. O'Leary? Uh, no, I, I think we talked about the Board of Health, uh, the meeting again Wednesday night. And again, just uh, my appreciation for, uh, I keep expressing it at every meeting on behalf of the board, uh, of their efforts of the, the board and, the, and also the administration and the health director and all the cooperation through the school department and everybody else. So they're doing a terrific job under the circumstances. Other than that, nothing else. Uh, Madam Chair. Amen to that. Much more meeting time and talk time and work time than anyone anticipated over COVID, I'm sure. Madam Chair, through you, um, Mr. O'Leary, I think you and I are going to receive an email from the Administrative Assistant, uh, Stephanie, for the Board of Health. So the meeting, I believe, has been moved to February 17th. Um, it was originally scheduled for this Wednesday evening, I think, as you had indicated. And my understanding is that it's going to be um, delayed. So that'll be a little more than a week to next late late next week it sounds like okay very good more information forthcoming <laughs> thank you all right um miss mr studo um well i'm not going to talk about pulte i think we had that discussion so that's good and i don't have to report on that uh the other project, the CPC, just uh, was talking about still continuing uh, for 148, 150 Park Street, which eventually um, Mr. Wheeler will be in front of our board here to, you know, talk about it. The CPC did vote to sponsor a warrant article for a town meeting for a zoning overlay district, uh, which is still, though, not been finalized how it is so it's just a preliminary seem like you know support and you know with just some revisions and it's going to come to us uh whenever we can get them in i he had a conflict mr wheeler's attorney had a conflict tonight so we couldn't make that uh happen um and he did though inform me that he will also have uh they did do phase one and phase two environmental studies which i said for this group because of you know being on the Ips, which is going to be important. So I like to just relay that to the board that he will have that for us. Um, and other than, uh, other than that, there are tomorrow, you know, if, if everybody's not tired of listening to me speak, uh, we do have the joint CPC and select board uh, interviews for the candidates. There's two, um, one at eight and one at eight thirty. So I think, um, you know, it's a posted meeting, and uh, I know that it was posted as a meeting of the select board just in case too many of us show up because, you know, it's really exciting stuff on a Tuesday, and then we would have to, you know, just want to make sure that there's uh, a meeting so we can, you know, do our thing without violating any type of uh, rule. Open meeting law. Open meeting law. So um, those are, uh, th yeah, that's what I had. Thank you. Any right. questions? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mrs. Gonzalez. Yeah, I'm, I'm all up to date right now. There's actually meetings happening this week that I'll be able to report on next meeting. All right, thank you. Mr. Walner? Um, yeah, just uh, Mr. Sudo, I think it's 745 is what's printed for the meeting tomorrow for those interviews. 
Seven forty-five is when it starts, but the first meeting is actually scheduled for eight. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, all right. Three things. One is uh, I heard back from UMass Gerontology. They are in process of assessing. This is for the age-friendly initiative. They are. They've updated us that they are quickly finishing the fourteen hundred surveys that they had received before. They're collating all that and putting the report together for us. And they're also making good progress in talking to other towns who are interested in uh, intergenerational community centers and uh, people who have age-friendly directors within their towns. So um, hopefully in a month, we're gonna see those results, which is sooner than I expected, but that, that'd be good for to share with the town because it's been, we were aggressive at first to get it done quickly, which is what we wanted to get done, but thoroughly. So that should be coming. Um, today, uh, uh, town administrator, myself, Phil Hertz, who is leading our rail trail project, and uh, town council finally had a conference. We, I think we were together for about two hours. As it turns out, there's always lots of details in any of these kind of things. It's a, uh, you know, it's a big project, um, but I think we made uh, good progress in getting, connecting the dots. We have to go back to Mass DOT to get more information about how, how all these carts work together. I'm being a little vague because I have like four sheets of notes here um, that I don't want to have to share with you. But it's basically, uh, we're kind of hitting another, um, this is kind of the marathon part of the project uh, to get all these elements together and getting coordinated. Uh, but Phil is still very much the detailed guy and is doing a fabulous job for us in pulling all this together. And again, for people who don't know, we already have an existing bike trail that parallels 62 as you go out towards um, the east side of town. Um, we just don't have a connection between that path and Ipswich River Park, which is our primary objective. And that's the part we're trying to connect the dots in. So, um, and once you get, also just so the town knows, is that once you get onto that trail in Winfield that goes to Peabody, it opens up a whole wide range of paths that you can travel on that go all the way up the North Shore. So it's, it's you know, getting this access from our town would be a major improvement to our town over the long run. So that's a good thing. And uh, the last thing I'll tell you about is the, um, it is Black History Month. And so the North Reading Human Rights asked me to say this to all of you, so I will tell you. The North Reading Human Rights Commission is sponsoring a book club Thursday, March 4th, 7 to 8.30 on Zoom. We'll be reading Stamped, a young adult book that introduces the, the concept of institutional racism in a very readable way. The author, Jason Reynolds, uses the humor to explore a very serious topic. All are welcome, and if people are curious about this topic, this is a great and safe place to start. Copies of the book can be obtained at Flint Memorial Library, who's helping get this work done. Uh, that's my report for the Thanks, Mr. Mr. Walner. Thank that you. because that is a private group do you have can you um give the groups i guess email or website for people to access it's not a town group so in yes. other words not town and north reading group but you usually give us the the um uh, do you have it handy i don't have it handy um <laughs> all right see if I can, yeah i'm sorry i'll, I'll try to remember you to do that give it to time. us last meeting but i forgot it so well anybody who wants to get in contact with them you can get in contact with me so okay. uh um, right. you can just look me up on the website and send me an email i'll be glad to connect the dots all right <laughs> thank you okay. sorry I shall, i'll remember that next time all right um and Mr. Gilberto, did we announce at the last, our last meeting that you had hired a new public health nurse? Oh, or did that uh, happen between that meeting and now? Because the days are I just think, blending, so. So I believe that we did report that um, we had, uh, had hired a nurse and we had committed that we would have her come to a future meeting. And that my hope is that we can time um, introducing her in the future meeting with uh, recognizing Ms. Bath uh, as well. Uh, they are working together right now um, for a, a bit of training. And um, you know Donna has been very active, uh, which is great. Um, and Pam has been working very closely with her. So that may be something we could talk about between you and I with regard to um, the next meeting agenda as well to recognize. Sure. Okay, that's great. But you are correct. She is, she is on board. And I think I, she was hired just prior to the last meeting, I believe. Yes. All right, perfect. Okay. so. And I, I'm all set. I have. I want us to finish before nine thirty. <laughs> so, 
So it'll be a Valentine's miracle. So do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Motion, motion by Mr. Sudo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. And I give credit to the Buddha next to Mr. O'Leary for this. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Walner. Aye. And Manu Pelli is aye. All right. Good night, folks. All right. Good night. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.